what I thought I would do is uh, rather quickly uh, just summarize a, a perspective, my personal perspective view on um, stem cell treatment for Parkinson's disease, both what's been accomplished and what challenges uh, lay ahead. And uh, you've had a very good introduction, I think, to um, many of the issues I want to discuss, so it'll help me speed things along. But let me just show you this sch uh, schematic view of the human brain uh, and highlight the fact that the cells of interest are these dopamine-producing neurons that are in an area of the midbrain, the substantia nigra. It's shown here um, with those brackets. Those cells then project uh, to targets that are elsewhere in the brain, the basal ganglia, the areas indicated uh, higher, <clears throat> I'm sorry, where those arrows are leading, uh, structures known as the caudate <clears throat> and the putamen. And in Parkinson's disease, the dopamine neurons die, and this projection uh, is, is missing. So the target structure, uh, the striatum and the basal ganglia, are denervated from this dopamine projection. And so the strategy is to replace those dopamine cells with replacement cells that are injected not in the original site of origin, in the substantia nigra, but rather in the target structure, in the striatum. And because there's only one class of cells that die in this disease, it's an ideal candidate for cell replacement therapy. But there's been already an experience for this, um, in the sense that, uh, as you've also heard 20 years ago, uh, the use of fetal, not embryonic stem cells, but fetally derived dopaminergic neurons uh, in patients with Parkinson's disease was pursued. And uh, these are often uh, heralded as proof of principle experiments that show how useful this approach might be in treating the disease. And when these studies began, they were a series of what are known as open label trials, not controlled double blinded studies. And they suggested several features that I think have uh, remained true today. First, that these cells can survive. And second, that some patients, uh, especially carefully selected patients, can show some benefit with this kind of transplantation. But in the 1990s, two large NIH double-blinded sham-controlled surgical trials were performed. And I understand from my, uh, uh, what I, I believe these were the first uh, sham-controlled surgical trials uh, that were performed. And I think that's a very important control to do. And the results, uh, however, showed very minimal effectiveness uh, the only patients that benefited were those that were under the age of 60, and even there, it didn't reach statistical significance. And they had adverse side effects. There were dyskinesias, which are spontaneous movements were, were difficult to control, although luckily they've uh, mostly been uh, treated with changing drugs and also with uh, deep brain stimulation. So what we have learned is that the neurons can survive, and they can survive even uh, in patients who are not on a continued immunosuppressant, and I think that's an important uh, uh, feature that came out of those uh, earlier trials. The other thing we learned, as you saw already, is that uh, dopamine production can be sustained in patients who get these grafts. And um, shown on the top tracing are patients who were treated, and the bottom is a patient who was not. And if you look at the two-year um, panels on the right, the patients with the disease have progressively lost dopamine function. The ones that have been grafted have actually maintained or sustained dopamine function. So there are some hints that things uh, with cell replacement therapy might improve. But the results are relatively discouraging. And most recently, um, to add insult to injury in a sense, there's the pathology of some of these patients, now nine or 14 years after they've been grafted. And uh, two papers which just appeared um, uh, within the last few weeks have shown that in the substantia nigra, in um, patients with this disease, there's a progression, as you saw, of synuclein, of, of uh, uh, inclusions that actually signal the fact that these cells are injured and dying. But in the grafted cells in these patients, uh, some of these cells are only nine years old, they show the same changes. So the alpha synuclein that you see in the right-hand panel has developed in a cell that was grafted uh, from a fetal source. And this is actually interesting in a, a several ways. First, it tells us something about the disease. This is not a cell autonomous or non-autonomous pro process. The cells themselves are, in this case, dying uh, because they're being killed, as it were, by something in the environment. And there's a hint that that something might be related to the microglial cells that surround uh, these grafted cells. And there's inflammation in microglial cells in normal Parkinson's disease. And this is actually an interesting feature in terms of potential therapeutic targets. There may be a soluble factor, something that's actually contributing to the progression of the disease that might become a, a target for therapy. In terms of cell replacement therapy, however, this is something we have to bear in mind. Grafting new cells into patients with Parkinson's disease uh, may uh, eventually uh, lead to the destruction of those cells by the disease itself. 
So with, with, I don't want to uh, make it seem too discouraging. And in fact, there are reasons to think that stem cell uh, approaches may do better than the graphs that we've just discussed. And so let me just summarize some of those reasons. One of the problems with the grafts from fetal sources is that they're just too few cells, and there are far too few donors, which in this case would be uh, of, of fetal tissue. And so with stem cell uh, therapy, the promise is that we can make an unlimited number of these cells. The quality uh, of the grafts is variable. They've been harvested from multiple patients. The preparation differs in every trial. With stem cell approaches, one hopes that the standardization and the defining of the particular cell types will lead to better results. The migration and integration of these grafts uh, has not been very good. Most of the cells don't leave the sites of injection. But there's some evidence that embryonic fetal-derived stem cells will actually integrate much better. And finally, there's the issue of graft rejection, which might be perhaps the most important reason that these earlier trials uh, have, have not been uh, as encouraging as we'd hoped. And there are strategies one can use with uh, engineered stem cells uh, that can make them patient-specific and reduce the risk of, of inflammation and, and graft rejection. There has been a significant progress in achieving the goal of actually making dopaminergic neurons uh, from embryonic stem cells. And this has really been based on understanding in normal development how these cells uh, are, are created, and then mimicking those factors sequentially in the laboratory. And so uh, Lawrence Studer, for example, has uh, a few years ago now devised a protocol that you can use to take an undifferentiated embryonic stem cell and turn it into a very uh, uh, large number of these dopamine-producing cells that would be ideal for the transplantation in patients with Parkinson's disease. So we've succeeded in, in, in understanding a great deal about how to make these cells in a laboratory from human stem cell sources. Now, I'd like to uh, spend a few minutes about uh, alternative approaches, and one in particular that my colleagues and I have been uh, trying at uh, UCSF. And it's not a replacement for the dopamine cells, the ones that are lost in the disease, but it's a strategy to, uh, to deal with what happens as a consequence of the loss of those cells. So this is now not a human, but in an, uh, a rodent. The dopamine projection is very much the same, and you can create a Parkinson's disease model by lesioning those cells and denervating that dopamine projection to the striatum. And you can then inject uh, dopamine-producing cells into the target, just as you would in the human. What we decided to do is not inject the dopamine cells, but inhibitory interneurons into the target, because we're trying to restore the balance of activity in the circuits in that part of the brain. As a consequence of the loss of the dopamine neurons, those cells become overactive. And by inhibiting them, by transplanting or grafting local inhibitory neurons, we might be able to restore that motor balance. And so um, I'm afraid you may not be able to see this. It's a little dark. Uh, but this shows the uh, little green cells, which you can't see, that have been grafted into this uh, structure. And maybe you can see those little dots. Uh, they've scattered all over the area of the striatum, which is something that the dopamine cells haven't been able to do. But these GABAergic interneurons do very well. So they migrate, they integrate, and they form synapses, or uh, electrical connections, with the neighboring cells. This is a higher powered view showing these cells and how they uh, sprout uh, axons that actually contact the uh, host neurons. And they function uh, as inhibitory neurons, which is shown here electrophysiologically. And then in uh, behavioral tests, they actually have improved the motor uh, functions of these uh, Parkinsonian rodents. And I just want to show two behaviors, because they resemble the ones we see in patients. Uh, one of them has to do with motor activity and running. Let me just show you this brief film. Uh, this is a rat running down a runway. We've dipped his paws in ink, and uh, he leaves footprints behind, uh, a little bit hard to see. And that allows us to measure the gait, which is the distance between the paw prints. And this is a measure of the speed the animals uh, move down that runway. And as you may know, patients with Parkinson's disease become bradykinetic. They're very slow, and their movements are, are uh, uh, difficult to initiate, and, and uh, their walking and their gait is slow. And that's what happens in these rodents. And the Parkinsonian animals, as you can see, their gaits are considerably smaller. After they've been grafted, however, with these inhibitory neurons, uh, the gates actually uh, become normalized again. In fact, even the control animals, which haven't been lesioned, when they're grafted, uh, when these cells are grafted into the same structures, they actually run faster down the runways, which, which is a sign of the fact that we're altering the circuit behavior of a motor part of the brain. And once again, uh, as patients with the disease in our uh, Parkinsonian rodents, they, they don't move very well spontaneously. And so in this open field test, as you can see, the Parkinsonian rodents tend to sit still. But after they've been grafted with these uh, interneurons, they become uh, much more active again. 
So I, I don't suggest that you know, this is the cure for Parkinson's disease, but I, I'm just uh, using it as an example of how uh, one can start thinking about other uh, ways of using cell replacement or actual neural cell-based therapies to alter circuit behavior and treat diseases like Parkinson's disease or epilepsy or spinal cord injury. And so I think that we're uh, about to, to see a burgeoning of uh, interest in alternative approaches that are only uh, deliverable by, by cells, uh, different than drug therapy or any other conventional therapies. Uh, the delivery of uh, growth factors, of trophic support factors by using stem cells as delivery vehicles is another example of how stem cells may make an impact on the disease process itself in addition to just replacing the dopamine neurons that might be lost. And so I just want to summarize by saying that Parkinson's disease is really an ideal target for cell replacement therapy for the reasons I mentioned specifically because a particular cell type uh, seems to be lost and could be replaced. Uh, research using cell transplantation, even in patients, has actually been teaching us quite a bit about the pathogenesis, the pathology of Parkinson's disease, and may actually suggest uh, new targets for therapy. And there's been significant progress in actually making dopamine neurons from human embryonic stem cells, which is really the, the first step in actually replacing these cells. And there are novel approaches emerging, including mo uh, modifications of the techniques of delivering these cells, which may improve the, uh, uh, the eventual clinical uh, outcomes. And then the problems that remain include rejection, the risk of tumor formation, delivery and integration. These are all uh, issues that are being addressed and that will need to be solved. Thank you for your attention.